Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, we are almost only two chapters away from finishing this book. Um, for this session, we'll be taking a dive into something quite different from the previous chapters. In the previous sessions, we were mostly focused in prediction. However, for this case, we are going to be covering uh, another, sorry, other type of algorithms, uh, not for uh, prediction, uh, but those for those which are labeled as a super, unsupervised learning. Uh, in particular, we will learn about principal component analysis, will also shortened as PCA, in order to reduce the dimensionality of data, uh, maybe for something like visualizations, or, or further or further informing that that data uh, as an input of a certain model, because some models uh, they do not perform as well if your data set is highly dimensional. Um, we will also be looking at, at algorithms for clustering, in particular k-means, and also this other one for hierarch hierarchical clustering. So just to begin with, what is the main difference between what we have been already doing covering and these other type of algorithms. Uh, well, in the, in the other sessions, we always have a response or a particular objective variable that it, it gave us a, a measure of how well our predictions were working, if our model was accurate or not. And in this case, there is no objective variable and there is not really something to predict. Uh, um, so in that sense, we do lose uh, what in this case they they call it a checker. Uh, so there is not like a definitive answer between uh, this algorithm, sorry, this unsupervised learning algorithm is better than this one because there, there is no check to like to get an accurate number or representation to to compare them. Uh, we will start with what is called principal component analysis. Uh, as I mentioned over here, one of its main purposes is data visualization. Uh, and that is because, I mean, we are limited to R3, so only three dimensions. Well, also even four, if we allow for things like, I don't know, color and such in a scatter plot of three dimensions. Uh, so this will be useful to reduce the dimension of the data but still to get a, a visual sense of what is exactly going on, uh, how are the variables related between each other and such and such. So, well, there, are, there is a little bit of technicalities. It's, I mean, it's mostly linear algebra. Uh, and, and in these notes, they do begin with the technicalities, but I prefer the, the other way around that they propose, when well, they don't propose it in the book, they also start with the technicalities and they, they mention the nice geometric interpretation. So let us start with the interpretation. It's in the book, so I will just say it. And it's that, suppose we have our data set, you know, it's like a, a table, so we model it as a matrix of n rows and, and p columns. Uh, and we want to get a sense of how can we represent this data, but using fewer dimensions. Uh, so not, not p dimensions, but less. Uh, perhaps, uh, not naive, but a, a simple idea may, may be to, well, in, in this p dimensional space, what is the what is the closest line to our data set? So to this point, to this point cloud that the, the observations in our data are defining over RP. So that would be a one-dimensional uh, representation of the data, the closest line to it. And we can also ask, well, for higher dimensions, what would be the closest plane to this data set, and such and such. And so what we're basically doing is uh, trying to model our data using uh, spaces of lower dimension than the original, in this case, less dimension than P, only M dimensions. Um, 
Well, and the technicalities that come uh, for doing this, well, they start for with, F. well, I don't know if it's called normalization because it's also called standard, standardizing the variables. Uh, but we will simply treat our data as if it had a zero mean. So we perform this information and also um, a standard deviation of one. So we begin, we begin with this normalization. Then uh, what we are looking for is, well, there are two equivalent ways of, of getting to the same place. One would be to get a lower dimension, a lower dimensional representation of our data, that is the closest to it with respect to some specified metric, and for example, the Euclidean distance. Uh, but other way to do it is to, for our lower uh, dimensionality, sorry, for our lower dimensional model of the data, uh, how much of the variance of the data are we capturing? How much information are we losing or not? Uh, and, and in that case, we would we would like to have the highest variance because just like we are capturing most of the information of our data, even if we are lowering dimension. Uh, and so with these two ways to model our problem, well, then it comes a mathematical part. Uh, but we, but we're what we're going to be basically be doing is that giving our predict well our features that is x one up to x p we're going to project them into a a lower dimensional space uh, and for projecting I mean basically doing the, um a linear a, a linear product uh, via a normal vector. So in this case, this normal, sorry, or normal, no, unitary norm vector. So what we are doing is basically taking the linear product of our features, x1 up to xp, with some uh, unitary norm vector. In this case, this phi 1m up to phi pm. So this is a representation of our observation. Well, the initial observation, the well, is being projected into a lower dimensional space, in this case of M dimensions, uh, via this linear product with a unitary norm vector. Uh, well, uh, and there's also these, these three terms, these weights that are given to the initial features, well, they are called loadings. Well, L O A D I N N D S. Uh, so, in particular, I mean the optimization problem that we're working with is this minimization, uh, also restrained to this particular norm. Uh, but the but the main idea is that, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we're working with lower dimensional spaces. Uh, not only a line, not only a plane, but constructing them one by one. So starting with a the line, then with a the plane, and such and such up up to um, a space of n dimensions, and that will be all all of the necessary info for this uh, dimensionality dimensionality reduction. So in particular, I mean to not to not get too much into the mathematical parts. I can take a look over right here. Maybe we'll share the three points in the book. Yeah. Okay, so we're working with with the data set uh, of population and um, I think so. Well, in the, let's focus on the one in the book. In the book, it was a set of uh, of crime. The the original was this one, so about U.S. arrests. So we had like rates for rape, for murder, and such, but also factored uh, via a particular state. So after performing PCA uh, up to two dimensions, what we're graphing 
where we are looking at this graph is, well, what is the first principal component that we get? So that is, that would be the part of the, well, the vector that represents the line that was closest to the data. And also over here, what is the second principal component? Uh, and this second principal component represents the vector that wants a joint, no, that consider with this principal component, these two vectors define the plane that is the closest to the data. So, uh, and they are orthogonal. So with these lower dimensional representations of the data, for example, over here, taking into account these, these directions, they are telling us, for example, which is which is the direction for which urban population uh, changes the most and and the states for which that is the case it says for example is Delaware, Oregon, Washington, New Jersey. And then for this other orientation, well it's labeled as right. What would be the direction for which the data is changing the most with respect to this particular well, variable in the original data set of US arrays. Well, it says to be more common in the cases of Missouri, Texas, and such and such. Uh, and well, and similarly for both the other features that we have in our original data set, both for assault and for murder. Well, that would be a, a, a sort of graphical representation, well, interpretation of what these components uh, are being useful. Uh, but it also can be analyzed numerically because these components are vectors. Well, they have norm one. And as we define it, as we define it over here, they basically are assigning weights with respect to the correlation between the features. And in these weights in particular. So once given these particular vectors, well, once calculated, sorry, these particular vectors, for example, the author mentioned this interpretation that the, the bigger the number, uh, and these numbers are going to be between minus one and one. So the bigger in absolute value, it would indicate a, a higher a correlation with respect to the specified variable. So for example, for this principal component, for this first principal component, the the highest value, well, in, no, the highest absolute value occurs at this, and that is mean that that means that it's taking into account a higher weight of the assault predictor. Similarly, for the murder, sorry, for the assault feature. Similarly, for the murder feature, uh, and also quite similarly for the for this other uh, feature but it happens to be quite low that is close to zero uh, for this other feature uh, for one population so it does in that sense given that these three values are the highest while this is pretty low well it's telling us that what we are capturing with this uh, principal component with this vector is a sense of the, as they call it over here, a measure of overall, overall rate of serious crimes. So like a variable for crimes. Uh, but in the other case, for this second principal component, uh, now we do take into account the, the, the sign, because as I, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we're also taking into account that correlation, so that can be positive or negative. Um, for example, for this particular, where it is pretty close to zero, what that is telling us is that uh, with respect to rape, uh, with this specific principal component, uh, they are being detected only average values of rape. So it's not like high correlation or low correlation. Uh, that is not the case, however, with urban population, because now it is the highest in absolute value, and it's pretty close to one. So 
what what that means is that this particular the supercomponent is capturing much of the information or much of the variance uh, with respect to this uh, feature. Uh, and now with respect to the sign, well, these values are also, well, sorry, this value is also pretty low, uh, but in, part, in particular over here. So it would be like, well, it's almost 0 0.5 in absolute value. So there is some correlation. Uh, however, due to the sign, we would, we would infer that uh, this particular principal component is capturing a, a negative correlation with respect to Morgan. Well, and I think that's basically what they also cover a bit of example of, of the book. Well, of the, of the notes. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so, so now we know that, well, how to construct the model. Well, we don't know how, but we know of a technique for uh, lowering the dimensionality of the data. However, it would be also important to know that given now our lower dimensional representation of the original data set, uh, how much of the information have we captured? How much do we lose? So that's where that's when this uh, concept of proportion of variance explained uh, comes up. Well, I don't remember this part, but it seems to be uh, similar to what was covered about R2 square and such and such, but now not using the original features, but using the the principal components as the vectors for performing that, that analysis. So continuing on, uh, well, we already mentioned why about the scaling. Uh, I mean, in the original question, it was almost evident that the metric was going to, to be important because as we said, if we are looking at a one, well, a line, so a one-dimensional representation of the data, well, ah, and we want the closest one to our data set, uh, by specifying that metric, well, a particular metric, really anyone, uh, we're already taking into account the, the problem that may arise due to different scales between the predictors. Something similar that happened when we did uh, well, it was in a previous chapter. I, I don't remember which one. But, but in that sense, so for example, so something like Maybe salaries can range from, I don't know, to a thousand to a million, but maybe other other variable is just like, I don't know, number of children. So it only goes, well, not only, but it would be expected to go to maybe something like zero to 10. So in, in that sense, it is recommended to perform this scaling of the variables prior to performing PCA. Um, yep, yeah, only that about that. Uh, then other algorithms that we are going to cover in this part uh, are clustering algorithms. And as the name suggests, uh, we are also looking at 
a lower a lower representation of the data. But in, in this case, it's not so linear algebra, but really to, to get a sense of only a particular number of groups, uh, which share a lot in common. So there is a high sense of similarity between them. Uh, and usually that is going to be specified by the some metric. So we're going to be looking at well, first at k means clustering. Uh, it's a pretty simple one. It it doesn't really find a global minimum, but it kind of randomly iterates in order to find a global minimum. Sorry, a local minima. Uh, I will, sorry, there was an interesting comment about this. Uh, about what is the difference between PCA and clustering? <laughs> so let's see, it's a, PCA looks to find a low dimensional representation of the data to explain a good fraction of the variance. Meanwhile, clustering looks to find homogeneous subgroups among observations. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so in that sense, with clustering, we only get like, well, well, it depends on the case, but we would expect something like maybe 10 groups and such and such. Uh, but PCA, you still have a bunch of rows, but only the dimensionality went down. So for the K-means algorithm, uh, as the number of as the number, as, a, as the name suggests, uh, we start with a specified number of clusters that we desire. Uh, I, I am not so sure how much this k number behaves like a hyperparameter? Because I mean, we're working with un unsupervised, but there is also semi supervised learning. So, like combining some of the techniques of unsupervised and supervised. So, in that sense, maybe it can be a sort of hyperparameter once you first cluster your data and then use that information into a supervised model. Uh, so we start with defining how many clusters, how many groups uh, do we want for our data set. Uh, and, and as it says, then this algorithm is going to assign to each observation only one one of the clusters. So we're partitioning, we're partitioning our data set into these C1 up to CK sets. All of them is going uh, to wait to. So the idea uh, of what defines a cluster is this one over here, is that we would expect that within one, sorry, within every specific cluster, like isolated from the other ones, the variation would be the, as, the smallest as possible and variation between the features that I mean, we have in our data. So in that sense, uh, we can define this measure. It's called within cluster variation. Um, for example, if we take a look at this and uh, they generate some data uh, from a normal distribution to columns. This is the data generated. They are they have been assigned. Ah, they, they have been shifted so that they can be assigned different groups, the group A and group B. And let's see, it's going to start with it's going to perform the K-means algorithm, only taking a, a generating only two groups. I mean the first one two. Uh, and n star, I don't remember what n star did. I don't, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's like the observation you start with. I think that. How do we start with 20 observations? Oh no, like, 
so how many like there's a certain number of dots and i'm assuming like i could be totally wrong because i might be thinking of something else but it's like you start with one of the points you start with one of the points and then you're kind of doing the um whatever mathematics they're doing it they're doing it based on that point i don't know if it's like called the seed or i have to look it up but from what i recall i think it's like that's the observation they start with and then they do the mathematics after that one mm -hmm. i'll look it up really quick For example, for this particular case, once they do the, well, they perform the k-mensal origin for two clusters, uh, and they color via the cluster assign, uh, they do get that the, the correct cluster was assigned to the observations, uh, given these, uh, well, almost trivial separation that we can see, uh, even, even it's visual, it's a clear, separation even with the uh, cyclotron. So, I mean, we can see that there is a line over here. So it would be something like even a, a marginal classifier uh, as we saw for uh, support, well, not support, but for vector, uh, not super vector machines, but the, the most basic model ones of that, I think they were called marginal classifiers, no, maximal margin classifiers. They would probably also get it right. Okay, so there is a comment. M start. If it, if centers is a number, how many random sets should be chosen? Yeah, that, that's from the help uh, guide in R for K means uh, function. And it, it it relates to the center. Okay. You know, the center of each of the clusters. And yeah. what it does is that it assigns how many times random sets to find kind of a, you know, a region where the center should be. How many times what? Uh, how many times uh, you are going to do this random, you know, kind of a random sampling uh, yeah. to find the region where, you know, the center, you know, should be for each of the groups. Okay, okay. Okay. Because if you don't use this, then you are determining, you know, uh, uh, you know, rigidly, what is the center of the groups. So it, it's 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 kind of a it's kind of a startup, uh, seed that you're using to find the region where the center should be. For each group. So we find it like inspecting visually the data. What was that again? If we define this n start number, like taking a quick look at the data. Right. Uh, for example, in this one, it's going to be uh, 20, right? Yeah. So it's going to, you know, do uh, the centering of each group is going to do it 20 times. And what I believe is going to happen is that depending on the movement of that center, okay, within, you know, the group, is going to determine, okay, this should be maybe, you know, maybe an average or a medium. Uh, this, will, this should be the location of that, of that center of each group. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to determine in a random way what will be the center of that group instead of just doing, okay, this is going to be the center and that's it. All right? If you don't use that, that parameter. Yeah, it's a, it's a matter of locate, locating that, that center for each of the, of the groups. We can vary depending on the iterations that you do. Uh, something that I wasn't quite clear on, I didn't get it because we are working with, uh, I mean, because there is some randomness that happens uh, with this algorithm, mm -hmm. but it's only looking for a local minimum. Uh, once we fix this and start, like if we run this code many times, would we get the same result uh, as if we had set originally 
uh, some particular seed? Uh, or is it not sufficient? You have to use you have to use first the seed set seed right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you should get reproducibility. But if you change the end star, for example, instead of 20, uh, you you know, you do it to 50, that center could vary. Okay, you know, within the same within each of the groups. So the, the set seed is going to give you the the you know the random number generator for the you know for 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 the algorithm. But the N star is going to give you, you know, uh, the random location, the random location function to determine the center of each group. Mm, okay, but it's not like defining uh, a bigger and bigger N star is going to take us closer to a global minimum, right? Uh, the thing is that when you use k means, uh, the metric is not like the like the global minimum that, that you're mentioning. The metric is more in terms of how well those points are within each group, and then between the groups, how far are they? Okay, so there are there are a couple of metrics here that they are trying to get or minimize or maximize. So for each point in the group, you are trying to minimize the distance, right? Okay, the, the total the total within, the total within the distance from the center to each of the points. Then the other metric, which K means is trying to do, is trying to distance each group from each other. Okay, so you have distinct group with, within that, that space, you know, where the points are. Okay, so you are doing both. So you're minimizing and maximizing. So minimizing locally, but maximizing. Yeah, minimizing apart. the center and the points within each group. Okay. 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 Minimize it. So you have a cluster, right? You know what, what you call it, a cluster. Then between the clusters, okay, you want to maximize that distance. All right. So there's going to be a further iteration to try to minimize the points within the center of the cluster and then maximize uh, the, the centers of the cluster itself. So you get more distinct uh, clusters within the space. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, well, there was also uh, an important part about k means and it also relates to PCA. Um, it's what to do with what Ricardo just mentioned about this sense of similarity that points can, can have and uh, depending of in which dimension do they live in. Uh, I think it was in the first chapter that it was mentioned about this topic of the course of dimensionality. Uh, and, and it basically boiled down to the fact that once your data is highly dimensional, uh, I mean, there are too, too many factors or too many degrees of freedom uh, as to say, uh, as to have a, a clear way to say that these two observations are similar or quite related to each other. Uh, and that is not the case, for example, uh, well, for something trivial, like only one dimension, because we can say that, oh, if two, if two numbers are close, they will, in a way, they are similar, but this this idea of clone of closeness uh, gets a bit tricky in, in high dimensions. So, well, I, what I just learned last week is that well, two things. One is that if even though k okay means, I mean, it's pretty it's pretty fast, uh, despite its simplicity and such and such. Uh, if we, if you were to use it for high dimensional data, it tends to not cluster such well the data. Uh, well, and that is given this, uh, this problem about the course of dimensionality and, and the fact that as Ricardo mentioned, uh, K-means is trying to look for a sense of similarity between points, well, by cluster, and then also to differentiate them, to make it 
to make clusters far apart from each other. So in that sense, uh, something that that happens to be useful is that if you have a high dimensional data, but you want to cluster it, well, you can apply PCA to it. And then given, well, calculated now the lower dimensionality representation of the data. Now it's to that data that you can apply, well, let's say safely or with maybe with more confidence in the, in the result. In this class, well, this particular case of clustering algorithms. Uh, I think that is also something covered in what is called spectral clustering. I, I haven't really looked that up, but from what I glanced, I think it was in Wikipedia. It, it does have to be with this problem uh, of clustering data that is quite highly dimensional. So uh, th there are other techniques for doing that. Um, and the other one, uh, well, the other topic about k-means, and I'm not sure. I'm not so sure what it happens. I mean, I only so it maybe some of you uh, have more information of the topic. Is that if your data has holes? So imagine like uh, simply a scatter plot in in R two, but that is representing a donut. So we have like a hole in the middle, uh, and well and uh, and the other part of the, of the donut, uh, we all know what we're talking about. But it, it mentioned that for those type of cases of data with holes, well, well yeah, with holes, uh, that this type of algorithms do not work. Uh, does any of you know why? Uh, be before delving into that, Lucio, I was going to mention that one of the challenges here is to determine the optimal number of clusters, okay? So for example, if you don't have any, any background on, on your data on what could be a possible you know, number of clusters, for example, uh, sometimes you have to do uh, different iterations you know, from the same, using the same k-means with different number of clusters. Okay, let's say from two to uh, to eight. And there are several methods. Uh, maybe the book, you know, will we'll, we'll, uh, you know, we'll discuss it. But there are several methods to determine which is the optimal minimum. But in reality, you know, in the real world, usually if we have the goal of, for example, those, these points that we're seeing in the space, these points are, uh, you know, transactions, okay? So we want to see uh, what kind of patterns can we extract from a transactional data set so that we can then segment that data set into different profiles, okay? So sometimes that number is already given to us, okay? So let's say that we want to see what are the four clusters that this data, this k-means can provide with the data that we have? And from those number of clusters, then we can you know, uh, uh, receive some information about them. So for example, you have transactions, right? You have customers and you have uh, age of the customers, uh, the product that they, that they are buying, et cetera. So one of the things that you could do is, okay, I want to segment which are, which are the customers that spend a lot in which products. The other one that customer that spend uh, uh, not, not much and what products are the ones that they're spending and so far. So you can have a, a, a couple of combinations depending on how many clusters uh, you are segmenting uh, your, your space. Uh, that's not very, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it takes some practice, uh, you know, to, to, to do this. Uh, and, and one of the things that is very good to know is how is the data, you know, extracted? How is the data extracted? And if there are some patterns that you can see pre, before uh, doing the k-means. The other question that you said about the donut uh, thing, 
uh, there are many methods of clustering. Remember that the k-means uh, is a distance. It's a, it's a distance metric, right? So you are taking plus uh, points that are similar to each other based on the distance of that center. If the distance overlaps, <laughs> you know, within each group, the, the k-means is not going to work very well, right? Because he wants to separate those centers. And if you have a donut, okay, once in the in the in the in the, in the interior or just in the exterior, they're sharing that same center. So you need other kinds of clustering mechanism to do that. Uh, K-means won't, won't, won't work there. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, also, well, I don't know if I ever mentioned, uh, but K-means is also a sort of the, the most particular case of a sort of topological analysis uh, because, well, each cluster in a sense is a sort of, well, mathematically it is called a connected component. So like a part that can't be, well, no, only, yeah, only that, uh, a part. So, but in, in that sense, uh, I mean, connected, connected components is one of the most, well, literally the first uh, topological invariant that one can analyze uh, from a space in order to differentiate it. So is it connected, is it not? Uh, as, as we also mentioned, other type of topological invariants. So, uh, and by that mean, I mean something like some non fundamental properties of how the space is connected. Uh, so some other kinds of those uh, of those uh, values to differentiate two different two different spaces is for example the number of holes. So in that sense, for example, uh, a sphere is different to a donut because a sphere has no holes, but a donut has one. Uh, and this idea of holes it also can be generalized to, for example, a, a one-dimensional hole. That that was the case for the donut that. I mentioned in the two-dimensional plane, but also uh, a two-dimensional hole will be, for example, now an actual donut. Uh, uh, we experience those in in our three-dimensional world, and uh, and the void that it has in the in the middle that would be a case for the two-dimensional hole. Uh, so I was mentioning that because uh, K means what it is doing is also capturing the zero dimensional holes that is which are the connected components that define our space in this case a connected components would be well we could we could think of the 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 biggest ball that encloses these points in blue because a blue a blue sorry a ball is a connected component and this other connected component would be well, what is the biggest ball that encloses, sorry, the smallest ball that encloses these uh, points in red? Uh, and, and, uh, and a general, well, interesting generalization of this idea of uh, uh, differentiating spaces between the number of, and the, between the number of dimensional holes that they have. Uh, so the general, the generalization of k-means, not only looking at zero dimensional holes. What is that is what is being done actually quite recently, I think almost almost 20 years ago only it was created. Uh, this tool called uh, persistent homology. Uh, let, let me share the the one of the most fundamental papers about it. Yeah. All right here. Well, I wanted to share it because I've been using it for my thesis. Uh, I mean, the, the mathematical part is not quite difficult. It's some um, topological algebra. Uh, but it's a pretty elegant generalization of 
at least this particular case of clustering of k-means uh, of looking for connected components via a sense of similarity well or non-similarity uh, using distances so i only wanted to show that okay Ah, well, the last part I didn't read about hierarchical clustering. So if anyone wants to do a comment on that, or if that would be it for the meeting, uh, what do you guys think? Yeah, I didn't get to read it either. Mm -hmm. Well, Ricardo, any comments? Um, in the hierarchical clustering, what we're doing is uh, presenting in a tree like, like it says there, a visual representation of the observations and how they are, you know, they, they, they are connected. And one of the things that usually happens, you know, uh, uh, related to k-means is that you can then uh, draw a horizontal line uh, to the clusters that you want to, uh, you know, you want to use. Uh, so they have some, you know, some connection, the k-means and the, and the hierarchical. But in the hierarchical, you can get really creative. And depending on which algorithm uh, you're using, uh, you can have different, you know, different groupings for the same, for the same dead data. So the, the hierarchical is a little bit more flexible in terms of the algos, algorithms that you can use than the, than the k-means. Yeah, for example, there, you can see that you can draw an horizontal line, you know, to get like four groups, you know, right there. Okay, instead of two, all right, you can get, you can get four, or you can get more, depending on how, you know, you want to uh, partition, uh, partition your, your data. Mm -hmm. How is a uh, different uh, performing k means? But I mean, you, well, I mean, you do it for the general data. You get your clusters, and then doing it k means for each cluster. Uh, how is it different to to this type of hierarchical clustering? Yeah, because remember that. Uh, uh... Uh, K means what it's doing is you know trying to center right you know those groups. Here you're you're using uh, a, a tree like uh, you know version of it. So th the way that you can then uh, arbitrarily you know partition your data is just drawing an horizontal line and see where it cuts. Okay, and for example, you can do an horizontal line where that text is. Okay, and you can get four you know, four different, four different clusters, okay? So it depends on the, it's more arbitrary in terms of the division than the, than the k-means itself. When you say uh, drawing a horizontal line, I mean, do you mean like cutting the feature space with a hyperplane or? or yeah, yeah, ca ca kind of, okay? I yeah, because right now you're, you're just seeing two colors, right? But you can say, okay, what happens if I divide instead of two, uh, divide it to four? So you just have to draw an imaginary horizontal line uh, between, you know, those two uh, separations there, okay, between those separations, and it will give you uh, four clusters, okay? So depending on what is your goal and what do you want to achieve, you can have different, you know, different sets of partitions. And if they make, you know, some sense in terms of the data that you're getting, well, you know, you can use it. All right. 
And like I tell you, you know, there's different algorithms. You know, I believe that this is more uh, hierarchical clustering is more is more flexible than the k-means because k-means is just k-means. That's it. You just alter the 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 number of clusters parameters. Okay. Uh, but here you can use different different uh, algorithms. So for the for the sort of case that you mentioned, that when there is some uh, field expertise uh, and you already know mm -hmm. like right. how many clusters you expect, uh, for that particular case, uh, would something like K means uh, have an advantage over hierarchical clustering or or not really? Uh, it, it depends. Uh, sometimes K means could give you a better a, a, a better uh, grouping. In each cluster, sometimes uh, hierarchical cl clustering could give you a better grouping. Uh, it depends. Uh, usually, you have to experiment with this, right? You have to experiment with different uh, mechanisms and see which is the one that is giving you, uh, you know, the best the best results. In this case, the the best groupings. All right. There's no one magical bullet here. <laughs> yeah, but but that comparison about. Which one gave us the best clusters? Uh, that would be via some supervised model, right? Like feeding those clusters into some model that we, I know that maybe it gives us some accuracy, and then we can compare oh for which for which model was the accuracy the most. Do you mean something like that? Not really, because remember this is on label data, so you're not going to get any labels here. Okay. Um, what happens is that, for example, in the k-means, you'll have, depending on the number of, of clusters, right? Let's say three clusters. Well, you're going to have three, three, three subsets of, uh, of points in each of the clusters. What, are, what, are, what is the commonality of those uh, points in each of the clusters? If you can get some in value information about that, then maybe k-means you know, is doing the, the job. In so sometimes, the K means the points, the groupings are not that you know clear. So maybe hierarchical clustering could give us a better understanding of you know how you know a different way of you know uh, doing the the groupings within the clusters, and that give you a better you know insight. So it depends. It depends on how you know uh, you know it depends on the data, right? And also it depends on which of the algos that you can use in higher clustering uh, you are you are choosing all right that's why I say it's a little more flexible because in k-means uh, it's a standard algorithm okay you cannot do that much in that algorithm because it's, it's very preset in the hierarchical you can use different algorithms to draw this uh, hierarchical structure you can use PAM for example partition uh, 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 or, or Medio is what it, what it says. You can use Clara. You can use Diana. You can use the different clusters for this particular model. Different, uh, uh, different algorithms for this particular model. Mm, okay, thank you, Ricardo. Okay. Well, that would be it. I think, well, I, I remember the book uh, mentioned it, but there is also an interesting part about recommend recommendation systems uh, when we talk about precedent, antecedent, and such and such. Uh, well, but it's not in the notes, so maybe it, it wasn't part of the book. Uh, however, that would be it.